Okay, grade nines, got it right this time. So what I want to do in um, this PowerPoint is to go over tasks five and six, which I've asked you to do. Okay, so let's have a look at task number five, first of all. So this was the, the, this was the questions on blood vessels. Okay, so remember I asked you to first do question number one. So the hole in the middle of a blood vessel is a lumen. Blood vessels that transport blood towards the heart, VW. VW, veins, blood vessels whose walls are only one cell layer thick. Remember to allow for easy diffusion, that's capillaries. Blood vessels that transport blood A for away from the heart, arteries. Blood vessels that have valves to prevent blood from flowing backwards. The veins, so the blood moves up the legs and doesn't pull and cause the little um, thing the valves to you know, become stretchy and then you get varicose veins. Right? Remember there was a word list at the top there that you could use. Um, blood pressure, well, it's going to be high in arteries because they take blood away from the heart. So the heart is forcibly pumping blood through them and that's why they stretch and recoil as the blood passes through. And that's what you're feeling when you push your a blood vessel against a bone when you take your pulse. And blood pressure is high, uh, lower in veins because they're much further from the heart. So heart, arteries, capillaries, low, low, low blood pressure there because or else the little capillaries will burst. And remember, diffusion must occur. And then those capillaries join to become veins. So going back up towards the heart, the blood is going to be under low pressure. But every time you walk and move, um, and the, the functioning of the semilunar valves is going to help that blood to move, especially upwards ag against gravity in your legs and even in your arms when your arms are down. There's a little trick that you can do. If you hold, okay, I'm going to do with this arm. If you hold your head, uh, one arm, above your head for a few minutes and then you have a look, okay? So I'm going to hold my hand up and then we're going to see just now. All right, so question number two. The pupil carried out an experiment to compare the elasticity of arteries and veins because they've got that muscle in them that allows them to stretch and recoil, okay? So she dissected out an artery and a vein from a fresh piece of meat. She then took a five centimeter length of each vessel, hung different weights on them, and measured how much they stretched. Now, I've already written here, the fact that she's got an artery or vein is the independent variable of the whole investigation. The fact that she took with five centimeters of each from of each vessel from the piece of meat is a controlled variable, or sorry, a fixed variable. We rather use the word fixed now. Um, and she hung different weights on them because she wants to see how much they stretch. So for the graph, the weight added is the independent variable, but for the whole investigation, it's whether, you know, which one is more stretchy, the artery or the vein. So the types of blood um, vessels. And then, um, and she measured how much they stretched. Length of blood vessel, how much they stretched. Remember, they were five centimeters in length, and yet it suddenly changed to 50 millimeters. So don't let that confuse you. So that's the dependent variable. All right, my arm's going a bit funny. Okay, so suggest how she could have decided which was the artery and the vein. Well, if you stretch those little blood vessels, you know, like stretching an elastic band, then the artery wall, the artery has got more elastic, so it should stretch more. The vein doesn't stretch as much, okay? State the independent variable in this whole investigation, okay, it's the type of blood vessel, artery or vein. Number C, which vessel stretched more easily? Well, if we look at the data here, you can see that the artery, at well, they were both initially 50 millimeters long or five centimeters, and... Um, it is now 65 centimeters. So it's increased by about one and a half centimeters, whereas the vein only went up or stretched, um, became a little bit longer, just over a half a centimeter. So which vessel, vessel stretch more easily? Explain why it needs to stretch more. The artery, because it, it's right near the heart, okay? And it needs to have more elasticity in it to be able to stretch and recoil as the heart is pumping blood through it, okay? Um, if she plotted her results, which variable would be placed on the vertical axis? That's the answer. It would be the length of blood vessel. So you're actually going to have here, uh, let's see if I can do this. Uh, let's draw some lines. Um, okay, so if I draw two lines, so there's my graph, 
and on the bottom here i'm going to have weight added in grand i'm not going to write everything here that will take me forever Ooh, or mass added actually in grams and then the length of the blood vessel and that will be in millimeters whoops whoops gosh this is rather difficult whoa okay so now you've got artery and vein so we can see here if this is 50 over here that the artery stretched more up to 65 so that you would label whoops artery there and then the vein only stretched up until about whoa that's a bit skiff um there's the vein so the line graph would be a little bit lower down okay so she would um let's just check here now so if she plotted her results let's just get out of here if she plotted her results which variable would be placed on the vertical y-axis it would be the length of the blood vessel which it gives an indication of how much they stretched Stay two variables that the pupil would have controlled in the experiment or fixed in you know, the fixed variables that would have been controlled well, both blood vessels started off with being five centimeters long or 50 millimeters. And how was it controlled? By measuring them accurately with a ruler and cutting them to the same length. Also, both blood vessels were taken from the same piece of fresh meat. They're not older or younger. They're not from different animals. Okay. And those are the two main um, uh, uh, fixed variables or controlled variables. All right, now the next one, okay, wait, let's just look at my arm. Why was I doing that? Can you see how pale my hand has become? So it's quite, you know, because of the blood, the um, oxygenated blood travels to my hand and then CO2 away, it was quite difficult for more oxygenated blood to, lead, to reach my hand, but it was easy for the deoxygenated blood to come away. So my hand went very pale because the cells weren't receiving enough oxygen. Okay, try that at home. Okay, so now let's look at task number six, which she, oh, where's it gone? Where is that now? There's task five. There's task number six. All right, so this is the um, questions on page number 73 regarding blood. So once again, you have got a little word list here. So out of which components of the blood? Okay, so which part contains dissolved glucose and other nutrients like um, amino acids, and other sugars and fats, etc., that need to be taken to the cells, well, they will be in the plasma. Okay. Which um, component carries oxygen attached to hemoglobin? Your red blood cells. So each little red blood cell will have about a quarter million hemoglobin molecules inside. And remember, the hemoglobin molecules need iron and then they can pick up oxygen. Right. So it's your red blood cell. Which part produces proteins called antibodies? The white blood cell. They make those little Y-shaped antibodies which latch onto the germ and stop it from getting into your cells and making you ill. Which um, seal wounds to prevent blood loss at a wound? The platelets. Now these have actually got fancy names. So red blood cells are actually called erythrocytes. White blood cells are leukocytes, okay? Um, and platelets are thrombocytes. Don't worry, I'm not going to ask you that. Um, so what part requires iron in order to function properly? The red blood cells, because then they make enough hemoglobin, and the hemoglobin, the pigment, the protein, can pick up oxygen. Which engulf bacteria to prevent infection, like amoeba? Take in the germ, destroy it using enzymes. Those are some of your white blood cells. Which assist in blood clotting? The little platelets shooting out fiber and threads which trap the red blood cells like spider-man okay now i love this little table because it really pulls everything together because we've learned about you know um, digestive system and what nutrients are formed when your food is broken down and now we're you know, seeing how the circulatory system transports these nutrients around to the cells and wastes away so where does oxygen originate Okay, this is NB, important question. It comes from your lungs where you breathe in. Where is it traveling to? Every single body cell for cellular respiration. Where does the glucose come from? Your small intestine, from the breakdown of carbohydrates into the blood, into all the cells for cellular respiration. Then the oxygen breaks down the glucose and what's made? Energy, that's the main function of cell respiration, but also waste products, CO2 and water. Okay, so where does CO2 come from? All the body cells. Where is it going? To the lungs. You're going to exhale it. 
Now your cells are also making water doing cell respiration. So where does it come from? All the body cells, excess water, where is it going to go to your kidneys? And your kidneys will make more urine. Now these are four substances. And I said list six others. And I know in that video, I gave lots of examples. How many did you remember? So from the breakdown of protein, amino acids, fat molecules or lipids that have been broken down, hormones made by your glands. So growth hormone travels in your blood, and makes different parts of your body's growth. Um, testosterone, estrogen, they affect the different reproductive organs. Adrenaline from the glands above your kidneys affect everything and your heart rate goes up and you um, breathe faster to try and get away or deal with a, a dangerous situation or if you're excited, okay? Um, antibodies made by the certain white blood cell, other substances that are transported in the blood plasma, salts like urea and table salt like from your food, vitamins, they need it by cells as they are, and they often help enzymes in cells to work, and they help with wound repair and immunity and stuff like that. The body does not break down the vitamins. They absorb from the small intestine as they are. And whatever other way, you know, if we are um, taking drugs and medicines, medicines know where to go because the cells are saying, oh, I need whatever, whatever. So there's like an aerial and the medicines will go to those cells with those aerials. And then the medicine will cause, you know, um, reduce the inflammation or whatever it's supposed to do. And then the breakdown products of the medicine will end up um, in your blood plasma and they will either end up in your urine. So that is why when they do drug tests, you know, at school, the lady comes around and you all take a little trip to the loo, um, random testing. Um, they're looking for certain metabolites, you know, in, in your urine because your body broke down that drug or whatever it was. And the waste products are then removed in the urine. Then they also dealt with by the liver. So the liver also helps break down medication and drugs. And you know, if, if um, people drink a lot of alcohol, eventually their liver can become damaged. It's called cirrhosis because the liver was not made to deal with so many breakdown products of alcohol and drugs and things like that. And that's why people can get really, really ill from, um, you know, from taking too much of these substances. All right. And I mean, we don't even know yet what um, vaping does. I've read articles where they say it's bad, it's bad in a different way. You know what, you're putting something in your lungs already um, that, is, that is not natural. We're already breathing in pollution and smoke and whatever. Why exacerbate the problem? Okay, so just a bit of friendly advice. All right, so now the last little diagram. It's a very simple diagram of the components of blood. So A is the white blood cell with the odd-shaped nucleus. B is a little fragment of a cell, the platelet that shoots out those threads. Three is a red blood cell. No, it's not really a donut. It's a, remember, it's a, whoops, it's a biconcave di disc, dented in from both sides, because now there's more surface area for oxygen to diffuse in. Okay, and then lastly, plasma, the straw yellow, pale yellow colored liquid in which the cells are suspended and in which all these substances are dissolved. So I want to tell you one more interesting fact. Yes, we always say that red blood cells transport oxygen. So hemoglobin joins with oxygen to form oxyhemoglobin. But in fact, some carbon dioxide, instead of it all being transported by the plasma, some of it actually attaches to red blood cells. It's one of my favorite words. So when a carbon dioxide joins to hemoglobin, it's called carbaminohemoglobin. Carbaminohemoglobin. Isn't that a lovely word? All right, so that's the end of marking task five and task, task six. Six, <laughs> not six.